Hi everybody, this is Jason from our online mythology class, Humanities 15. Um, I am recording video presentations in place of lecture. Um, I haven't done this before, and I haven't done it, I certainly haven't done it without students present, so there's no ability to have Q&A questions and um, answers and things like that. And the reason is, is because if you have student involvement, you can't reuse videos in future semesters. So those times when I would need to reuse a video from past semester that has students present from past semester, I can't. It's a HIPAA or OSHA or privacy um, rule. So um, I have to record a series of presentations without any student involvement at all so that in the future, if I need to access or use these videos, I can. So what that means is that um, I have to speak by myself into a camera with no human connection or interaction <laughs> at all for an hour and a half um, or an hour or whatever it takes. Um, but it's so I haven't done it before and I'll do the best I can, but it's very strange. Um, I um, would much, much, much prefer to have an in-class group where we can have a discussion about these things or to have a Q&A question and answer or some kind of dialogue or conversation um, would be my strong preference. Um, it's just not where we are right now. So anyways, uh, this first week we're doing, um, we're starting with topics in mythology um, having to do with the sun and the stars. Um, I mentioned before that we've decided to organize this class um, according to the first half of it, according to natural phenomenon. And so we have the sun and um, the stars and earth and water and fire and the moon and caves and mountains and those sorts of things, plants and animals. And every culture on earth has mythology that touches on those things. So this approach, rather than just starting out with the Vikings and having two weeks on the Vikings, this approach allows students to generate a lot more content from non-Western uh, mythologies. Um, or just sort of any mythologies at all. We will still cover plenty of Western mythology. We'll still cover plenty of Greek and Roman and Norse and Celtic and biblical uh, mythology, but we just, we just won't be bound by them. And so I find this is a much preferable way of approaching the topic of mythology. Myth is a Greek word and it means story. And logos is a Greek word that means study or reason or ra reasoning. So mythology is the study of stories. And every culture that has ever existed throughout the history of time and earth has told stories. And it seems ridiculous to me to just study the stories of one particular geographical location on Earth. We're all human beings, uh, whether you're from Africa or New Zealand or uh, Siberia or Rockland, California. Um, there are aspects of the human condition that we all share. None of us knows what happens after you die. All of us wants to feel a sense of belonging. All of us wants to feel a sense of safety. All of us want love. I mean, all of us are prone to the same negative things. All of us are prone to greed and self-centeredness. Whether you're in Africa or whether you're in New Zealand or whether you're in Siberia or whether you're in Rockland, there is a thing called the human condition. And it, it doesn't matter if you're gay or straight or old or young or rich or poor or foster youth or uh, it, it, it doesn't matter. Everybody experiences human consciousness, the deep parts of human consciousness, similarly. So when we tell stories out of those deep experiences, we can learn from each other. And we can learn from each other across culture, across language, across, across uh, uh, time. So the study of stories is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful way of studying what it means to be a human being. And to my way of thinking, you kill that by just saying, oh, we're just going to study Western mythology. That, that, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. 
So we've reorganized the class in a different way. And uh, it's still a work in progress. It's still ongoing. Uh, there's still a ton of work to do. Uh, but every semester, I think it gets a little bit better and a little bit better. And hopefully, um, these lecture presentations will contribute to that. So we begin with the sun and the stars. Um, and um, let's see here. The sun and the stars. Um, oh, see, so I'm already uh, getting into some... Let's see. Let's try this. There we go. Um, I'll begin with a, a myth. Uh, this myth is from the Bible. And um, so I want to, I guess I probably should start out by saying this, because some people, if you're a person of Christian religious faith, you might think, oh, here comes some teacher saying the Bible's a myth. Um, uh, that's not really what I'm saying. I'm not saying myth in the way that you're hearing it. I'm saying myth is a story. And the Bible has stories in it. So that's to me that's what a myth is a myth is a story whether it was a story that truly happened or didn't truly happen i don't care that's up to you to puzzle out for yourself that's your job <laughs> not mine i just say "Ooh, story <laughs> here everybody let's talk about a story so when i say that we'll talk plenty about uh, stories from the bible and i'll call them all myths i do not mean that they are just made up stories that didn't happen i i don't know it's not my job. I just know that they're stories. That's why I call them myths. So I want us all to be sort of very clear about that. That I'm going to refer to stories that you may consider sacred stories. Oh, and the same with Islam. Same with uh, Sikhism. It's not just Christianity. It's the same with. I mean, I'll I'll refer to stories from all of the religious traditions of the world as myths. And I'm making value judgments on none of them, whether they're true or not. I mean, some of them probably did happen in history. I don't know, but they are stories, and that's what we study. We study stories. So the first one is the story of the Magi, and this is a very interesting story. The Western calendar, if I were to ask you guys and girls uh, when Jesus was born, most of you would probably say the year zero, right? Well, wrong. Um, there was no zero when they made up the Western calendar. Zero is a concept that was invented by Indians and Arabs in the Middle Ages and so when the calendar was put together, they, there was no, the Europeans didn't have any idea of zero. So they just went from 1 BC to 1 AD. So zero, the, the time that most people think that Christ was born, is a mythological realm, which is wonderful. It's great. So in this mythological non-existent year zero, a star appeared in the sky. And three wise men from the east the, the translations say wise men, but the actual word in Greek is pretty clear. It's magi. And magi is a title. It means Zoroastrian priest. So the idea that three Zoroastrian priests followed a star to the birth of Jesus. See, this is the Christmas story. Uh, the, the three wise men see a star in the sky. It turns out to be the star of Bethlehem. And they follow the star. And they get to where the star stands over this little town. And behold, in this little town is a newborn baby laying in a manger. And they bring him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And so the star leads them to the birth of the Messiah. Now, that is astrology. <laughs> Saying that the stars can give us meaning and point us out to where the Messiah comes is a, a, a form of uh, thinking known as astrology. And um, for most of Christian history, Christians have not, they've de-emphasized, they've not really been all that keen on the idea that you can discover the will of God by, by studying the stars. And yet, right here at the beginning of the Christian story is exactly that. The stars are, um, have been, are and have been very, very powerful um, um, Parts of human thought and culture since the dawn of time. So, by the way, just to finish up this slide here, uh, that's why we put the star on the top of the Christmas tree. The star is the star of Bethlehem, and the symbolism is designed to guide the, us as the wise men were guided um, to the birth of Christ in our hearts during this Christmas season, the season of giving. That's the intention and uh, point of having a star on your Christmas tree. Um, it's a beautiful symbol. It's a wonderful symbol, and but it's under... Um, undergirded by the idea that the stars can reveal to us meaning and the will of God. 
So I want to talk about this whole um, 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 system of um, astronomy. And we'll probably begin with um, Babylon, the Babylonian culture and tradition. Babylon is in modern-day Iraq. Um, it's a culture and civilization that had a very, very long history, um, thousands of years. Uh, very, very influential um, in Iraq and in the areas surrounding Iraq uh, in a number of different ways. One of the ways that Babylonian culture and tradition um, was so influential um, was in their... Um, construction of ziggurats. Now, they didn't invent the ziggurat. That was invented by the Sumerians before them. And But a bunch of people from that area, you know, they had these sort of mountains, these, these little built up, you know, stairways that went up to a top, like, observatory from which you could observe the heavens. And the Babylonian astronomers and astrologers would go up to the tops of the ziggurats and they would study the heavens. And what they did is they divided the view around the ziggurat into 360 degrees. They had a, a different system of numbering. I forget exactly what the name of it is. Some of you know, I'm sure if you're a math major, you know this stuff. But uh, base six or something like that, it's called. But anyways, th the, the, the sky was in, divided into 360 degrees. And we still use this today. This is invented by the Babylonians. Um, it's not divided into 10 degrees. Our whole, most of our numbering system is in tens. Um, and you would think like, well, just divide it, divide it into, into 10 or 20 or some multiple of 10, and that would be more in line with how we do math. But this comes from a different numbering system, which is why you have um, 360 degrees divided into 12 um, chunks, 12 30-degree sections or slices. And that's our clock. You know, it goes to 12. It doesn't go to 10. It goes to 12. And each of the numbers from 12 to 1 is 30 degrees. Well, the Babylonians invented all that. And what they did is they, um, well, let me go ahead and tell the story of um, uh, Marduk and, and Tiamat first. Um, this is a very, very influential and important story. Um, and um, it's lived on in adaptations ever since. But in the beginning, there was Tiamat, who is the goddess of uh, salt water, and her husband, Apsu, is the god of fresh water. Um, and everything was water and formlessness and chaos. Um, and um, they, over a long period of time, uh, Tiamat and Apsu uh, created the god and everything in it. Um, they gave birth to the first generation of gods, and this first generation of gods grew up. And um, they decided that they wanted to kill their parents, Tiamat and Apsu. We'll find this in a lot of Bronze Age mythologies, and I don't exactly know why, but these, this theme of parents wanting to overthrow and kill their parents, uh, children wanting to over grow up and overthrow and kill their parents, um, there's been plenty of explanations for it, and we'll discuss some of them. Um, but, um, but they find out, Tiamat, the mother, and Apsu, the father, find out that their um, kids and uh, grandkids are trying to rise up and overthrow them, and so they become enraged and go to war on their um, children and grandchildren. Um, Apsu, the father, is killed, and the mother, Tiamat, takes the form of a ferocious uh, sea dragon, and she terrifies all of her children and grandchildren who flee away from her, except for one, and the one is uh, Marduk, which is one of her grandchildren. Um, and he challenges his grandmother, Tiamat, to single combat and uh, throws a net over her. Um, and then he attacks her with whirlwinds and tornadoes and lightning. And he finally kills her by shooting an arrow into her belly. Um, after she dies, he slices her in half like an oyster shell. And from the top half, he makes the heavens and divides them into 12 regions, um, which in effect creates the 12 signs of the zodiac, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and, uh, and then from the bottom half of, um, the shell, he creates the, uh, the, the earth. Um, he laid, uh, the earth over the top of his grandfather Apsu's freshwater body, which is why if you dig down into the earth, you'll eventually come to freshwater. 
Um, and from uh, Tiamat's eyes, he made the, uh, the, the grandmother's sea dragon that he, uh, eyes. He made the tigress and the Euphrates. And uh, Marduk spread grains and herbs and pastures and fields, uh, established rain, uh, seeds, cattle, sheep, forests, orchards. Um, he uh, created the earth and gave it uh, fertility and vitality. Um, and so he's a you know a great a great culture hero um, for the Babylonians, um, but from our um, um, point of view, one of the, in, the for the purposes of this lecture, one of the most interesting things that he did was divide the heavenly top half of Tiamat's body uh, into the twelve signs of the zodiac. So you have to sort of understand how the stars work, and it's a little bit confusing, but it's it's not really. Um, we're on Earth, and we're revolving around a star, but we're looking out at the wide universe, all these billions and billions and billions of other stars. So even in the rotation around our little star, our perspective on those other stars doesn't really change all that much. It's not like we're going over here and over here and flying around and everything. We're not really moving relative to the vast distances of space, which means that all the stars pretty much stay in place. They look the same to us year after year after year after year. Now, our, um, our Earth does turn, and so as it turns our perspective on the heavens, the heavens seem to rotate. They don't really, but they seem to because we're spinning. And we tilt on our axis a little bit. So our, our, our view of the stars rotates just a little bit like that. So the stars appear to us to be sort of rotating and, and, and tilting a little bit but very predictably it doesn't change it doesn't change year to year and so when you study the stars you find recurring patterns of behavior of these um heavenly beings by the way most cultures throughout time thought of the stars as heavenly beings or as campfires of the gods or some kind of something closely connected to divinity um the divinity in the heavens oh and that's something else i want to talk about for just a second a little digression here but light pollution. Um, we live in a world filled with suburban and urban light, electric, electricity. That very, very, very significantly degrades the starlight at night. And you can walk around urban and suburban neighborhoods and see maybe a handful of stars. And that's all because of the light human activity generates. Go out to where there's much less human activity. I live in Colfax, so and I'm closer, we're 2,500 feet up, so we're much, we're out of that. And go up there on a summer night and look at the stars and you'll see an entirely different sky. It's not a handful of stars. It's countless diamonds of light in the night sky. And if you go even further up, away further from Colfax, it, it doubles again. So before the coming of electricity and light pollution, before the 19th century, I mean, the stars were, you know, a massive part of people's experience. Uh, if it wasn't cloudy, they were just vivid in the sky daily. And every culture and tradition paid lots of attention to them. And they rotate and they move in their heavenly courses in a rational, predictable way. You could say, well, next year it's going to do the same thing. And they made pictures and constellations out of patterns of stars, especially the super bright ones that kind of stood out from the others. And they told stories about those, those patterns. And the, and the patterns, again, were very predictable. If you just look at the um, stars and you pay close attention to them, it will seem to you that this universe is rational, repeatable, and predictable because that's how the stars behave from our perspective. Um, and then we have the other ones. <laughs> and the other ones are the planets and the comets and asteroids and eclipses. And those are not rational and not predictable. And they give people a sense of terror and mystery and dread um, eclipses especially are just 
like there's no way of explaining it in traditional cosmologies i mean there's no there's it's it's like the sun disappears like oh crap (laughs) i hope it comes back because we're screwed if it doesn't you know eclipses are big deals and comets are just these strange things that just appear out of nowhere and it's like what is that thing is that a god what's he doing is he mad they don't have the vocabulary or the um, science to understand these things as material phenomenon, so they interpret them as supernatural phenomenon, and they don't know if that supernatural phenomenon is positive and beneficial toward them or not. So it creates anxiety. Planets do that because planets, you know, they don't make a whole lot of sense in their rotations. The inner planets, Mercury, uh, Mars, and, and Venus, make they're a little bit more predictable. Uh, not entirely, but a little bit more so. But the outer planets, Saturn and Uranus and um, Jupiter, um, are just pretty much unpredictable in terms of how they move across the sky to traditional societies. Now, you know, Western astronomy puzzle all that out later, and that's another story. So anyways, what the zodiac is, is 12 sections of the sky, each one um, defined by a particular constellation. And the constellations to me don't look like anything. <laughs> I mean, they don't. They say like, "Oh, those stars there; those are the twins." And I'm like, "Okay." I mean, I don't see it. But and here's a scorpion, and I'm like, "I don't, I don't see that either." But whatever. I mean, you know, it, it, in other words, the constellations almost never look to me like what people say they look like. Um, but the Babylonians divided up the sky into twelve um, uh, zodiac signs. And um, it was believed that whenever someone was born, um, the sun was in one of those 12 houses, and the moon was in another one, and there were planets were in different ones. And so all these movable objects against the stable backdrop of the sidereal heavens, uh, all all of these movable objects are frozen in time at the moment of birth, and then you analyze um, where each of those objects are and um, attempt to come up with an explanation or insight into someone's personality. That's essentially, a, that's astrology. That's your, that's your, you know, your, your chart. If you want to read your horoscope, that's essentially what's going on with it. Um, astrology has been very, very, very influential throughout world history. It was for the ancient world. All the Greeks and Romans practice it. It was uh, through the Christian era. Uh, Christians practiced astronomy. Even great great astronomers like Tycho Brahe practiced astronomy. I mean, Tycho Brahe is one of the legends of legendary astronomers of history. Uh, but he he practiced it, and it's still practiced to this day. Um, you know, people read their charts, and there's a very interesting kind of thing that happens when you ask people if they believe their charts. Uh, you, you ask people, "Do you read your star charts?" And they say yes. And, you, and you say, it's like 20, 20 to 25 percent of people. I mean, it's, like, it's not an insignificant number. 20 to 25 percent. And they say, do you believe your star chart? And then people say no. And they say, well, why do you read it then? And they say, well, because who knows? <laughs> That's essentially the conversation. People don't actually believe in astronomy, but they, you know, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I don't know. So even to this day, even in this modern Western scientific uh, worldview, uh, people still read uh, their star charts. And by the way, it's not it's not just Western tradition, right? China, China has their own uh, astrology. India has their own astrology. I mean, astrology is a living um, tradition uh, through which uh, people attempt to understand time, fate, and destiny, and the will of God. And it, And it's been all over the world that way for a very long time. So in our Western tradition, uh, the story eventually co- uh, comes back to Tiamat and um, Marduk and Marduk killing her and making um, the top half of her body into the heavenly heaven and into the heavens and then dividing that up into 12 chunks and then making constellations in each chunk and, and then teaching people how to analyze the meaning of the stars. Um, so uh, that is um, Tiamat and um, Marduk. Um, I wanted to basically um, talk a little bit about um, a particular uh, constellation, a couple of constellations, actually. Um, But the first one is um, Ursa Major. 
and uh, Ursa is from Latin that means bear. Um, some of you are familiar with the constellation, the Big Dipper. I think that was the only constellation that I ever learned. And you can see the Big Dipper here in his in his this bear's tail. Um, these other stars taken together are um, um, considered to make up the shape of a bear. Um, this is an interesting constellation to me, first of all, because it's only visible from the northern hemisphere. Like here's, here's the Earth, and if you're up here on the Earth, you look up and it's up there. People who live down here and look at the stars out that way, the, the, it, those constellations not up there. And if you're on the side, it's not over there either. It's only for the people in the northern hemisphere. Um, but one of the interesting, well, a couple of interesting things. Number one is there, um, every culture that I know of in the northern hemisphere looks at these stars and calls it a bear. That's bizarre to me because that could be anything, right? I mean, those stars right there, if you move, if you remove the image of the bear that's been superimposed on them, why couldn't that be a cat or a cow or a dog or any four-legged animal or something else entirely? I mean, it just can't be a coincidence that, and when I say every culture, I mean, the, the Norwegians, the Finnish, the Slavic people, the Russians, the Germans, the Native Americans, the Cheyenne, the Siberians, the Mongolians, the, um, the, the, the Indians here in California, the Shasta Indians, the um, Ojibwe. I mean, you just all over the Northern Hemisphere. All these cultures, all these different cultures look at those stars and go, yeah, that's a bear. And that just can't be a coincidence. I mean, there's no way that so many hundreds and hundreds of cultures can look at those stars and decide that it's the same thing. So how do you explain the fact then that every culture in the Northern Hemisphere looks at those stars and calls it a bear? Well, I mean, one of the ways of explaining, one of the possible ways of explaining is to say that the idea that it was a bear first happened a long time ago. And by a long time ago, we usually mean in this type of conversation, something of like the Paleolithic. Paleolithic means the old stone age, and it covers about, I don't even know, whatever, 50,000 50, years ago to 10,000 years ago, something like that. It's, it's not exact, but I'm, it doesn't matter. It's tens of thousands of years ago. That tens of thousands of years ago, there were, there were stories being told about that being a bear. And that over time, the, those stories just kind of spread out and evolved and shaped the differing cultures that took them to different parts of the world. And that's probably true. When you look back into Paleolithic archaeology, you can find interesting bear remains laying next to human remains. So you're looking at Paleolithic um, archaeology, and there's a burial site, and there's a human body, and there's a bear body like next to it, and they didn't kill each other, they were buried together. And so we know that in Paleolithic European tradition, there was what we call, they would call this a bear cult. When we use the word cult in the academic words, there's no value judgment. We're not saying, oh, that's a cult, yeah, you're in a cult. Cult is from the Latin word cultus deorum, which means care for the gods. Cult actually means care. Um, and what we mean when we use the word cult in academic language is a system of rituals and myths that are oriented towards a certain supernatural or divine uh, being or phenomenon. Um, and so the bear cult found in Europe, Asia, and in the New World too, in North America as well, um, we find evidence of this very, very ancient um, system of rituals and myths that connect to the bear. And we suspect that this, this bear cult probably originated many tens of thousands of years ago and spread. When a, when a myth or system of rituals spreads by word of mouth or, or by people taking it to traveling and taking a myth or a ritual with them, we call that diffusion. And that's going to be a word I'm going to ask you to know. This is how myths spread. They diffuse. They spread out. Uh, through space and time. 
when you tell a story to your grandchildren and they tell it to their grandchildren and then their great grandchildren move to a different part of the world and they tell the story, this is how these stories and rituals replicate themselves and spread. And that's a process we call diffusion. So with respect to the, the bear cult, it probably has its roots in the Paleolithic past. And it's still a matter of really kind of, it's very, still remains very strange to me that every single culture that I know of looks at that, those stars and calls them a bear. And that, you know, again, that includes Eskimos and Germans. <laughs> I mean, anybody on the Northern hemisphere is like, that's a bear. Bears are uniquely important animals in, in North, um, in the, in the ecology and human, um, experience in the northern hemisphere they're apex predators like humans they're also scavengers like humans we compete for food we fight for food sometimes we kill bears sometimes bears kill us that's a quote actually from the big lebowski sometimes you eat the bar sometimes the bar eats you um and i prop to me probably most importantly is we both um need caves for security warmth and shelter so we compete probably for you know for living arrangements um in the national uh, epic of finland the kalevala which we'll talk more about during the course of this class there's pretty extended passages um directed towards bears and uh, these passages are filled with admiration and love and on competition also. I mean, you read these wonderful Finnish um, uh, bear passages, and it's like, oh, wonderful honey pod bear, you are so great and sweet and kind. Now remember what you promised all those years ago that you wouldn't attack our goats. You, your people promised us that. I want you to hold, I'm gonna hold you to that. And if you can attack our our stuff we're gonna to have to have a problem but we're not but but you yourself we know that you are trustworthy and honor i mean it goes on and on like that for a long time people talking to bears and this really loving way but in a in a competitive way too and in a way that came to blood sometimes there's another long extended passage in the call of Allah that talks about a bear um slaughtering ritual or somebody would go out and they would kill a bear and they would bring the body of the bear back. And it was a big community. The, 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 um, it wasn't a celebration. It was a celebration. It was a celebration. They killed the bear, but it was like super respectful of the remains of the bear. Like every, the, every, every part of the bear's body was treated as sacred and was honored and respected. And they prayed thankfulness to the spirit of the bear and they sent him with blessings to his home in that constellation they say well that's where they live they live in that constellation when they die so well, thank you bear and go blessed be with your people and just this you know outpouring of of um, devotion towards the bear and you see similar things across the northern hemisphere um ursa major and the bear mythology and rituals associated with it could be a complete probably be a complete class in and of itself uh, it's very very interesting the point here that I want to really sort of drive home is I think most scholars would say this is an example of diffusion. That sometime in the Paleolithic past, there was a bear mythology and system of rituals and rites. And that over many, many tens of thousands of years, this bear cult uh, spread. And that explains why all these cultures in the Northern Hemisphere look at the same constellation and have the same interpretation of it. Okay, um, the next one is, um, I feel like I want to take a breath I'll Take a breath for a second. Information after information after information, you know, it's, this is where in, in a class I would just rather, okay, so what do you guys think and what are your questions and stuff like that. Um, without that kind of human interaction, it's just like, okay, next slide, next bit of information and just, Feels overwhelming and overloading to me. So, I'll talk about something else for a second. This guy this morning, he filled up my my coffee, 
and he filled it all the way to the, the very top. And he put the lid on and he gave it to me. And I walked out to my car and I was like, okay. I mean, I didn't notice it or whatever. And it's too hot. I usually wait a while before I start drinking. But as I was driving, I had my coffee between my legs. It was spilling all over it, all over the uh, lid, getting all over the place. And I was, I was like, oh, my God. Finally got out of the car and I pulled the lid off and it was all the way to the top. And I was pretty angry. I started out the day pretty angry. So if your job is to pour coffee... Don't pour it all the way to the top. Leave a little bit of room for it to kind of slosh around without going over the side. I just wanted to talk about something else other than mythology for a second. And that that's what I'm looking at. So I want to um, next talk about I, I one of the most mystifying things that I know of. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I just don't really understand. Um, I just don't really understand this. Uh, it's a constellation um, uh, called the Pleiades. Now, the, the, Ple the Pleiades gets its name from Greek mythology. You know, a lot of our stuff has its origins in Greco-Roman tradition, but the daughters of uh, Pleione, who was a nymph or goddess or whatever, they had she had seven daughters, and um, and the hunter Orion saw Pleione and her seven daughters and fell in lust with them and chased them and they ran away and he was chasing them for years and years and years and finally they they were at the end of their rope and they they prayed out to Father Zeus, Zeus. Deliver us from this rapist who's trying to get us. And uh, Zeus um, makes a path for them into the sky. And so they, f they go up into the sky, uh, the, the, the seven uh, Pleione and her seven daughters. Uh, but Orion is able to get up into the sky too. And he follows them to this day. And if you watch a time-lapse photo of the heavens as they rotate, you see these you see these seven, this cluster of seven stars, followed by a. Uh, it looks like a bow, or what? Like a, it's supposed to be a hunter with a bow, followed by a constellation of somebody with a bow chasing them like that. That kind of explains the, you know, the the, the movement of the of the seven sisters and this hunter Orion. So we call it the Pleiades, and this is an extremely well. This is one of the most well. This is probably the most popular constellation there is, because if this is the Earth. Uh, the, the the Pleiades is that way. It's off the side. It's equatorial. It's within whatever how many degrees of the um, equator. So even when the Earth rotates or twists, uh, people can still see it. It's it's out there, and people can it, northern and southern hemisphere can see this constellation. And so stories are told about the Pleiades in both hemispheres all over the world, and uh, it is. Like I said, it's probably the most common constellation there is. Um, it's very bright and very close. Um, because it's near the horizon, the moon and the sun frequently come into, um, I don't say conflict, but they, 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 they pass over each other. It's, it's frequent visitors to the sun and the moon. So there's all kinds of myths and stories about it. Um, and, um, and it, it is an interesting and amazing uh, constellation. Uh, the Hebrew Bible tradition said that it's actually a hundred stars or something like that. That were it's a cluster of stars that were sort of heaped up on each other. Um, it's the symbol for Subaru. Subaru cars have used used the Pleiades as a symbol. I don't know what the I don't know what the thinkers behind the Subaru Corporation why they picked it, but that's what it is. That if you look on the Subaru logo. Um, stories about it are told in Thailand, Norway, Africa, Australia. You know, science called it Messier Seven or something like that. It's very pretty close, four hundred and forty-four billion light years away, or whatever. So it's, it's really close. It's like next door, so it's pretty bright, and it's just a very significant constellation. But the thing that is 
mystifying to me is the Aboriginal story of the the, uh, the Pleiades. And um, I'll tell you a little bit of that story, uh, one of the versions of the story, um, uh, Ku Rongkong Kalpa, um, from the people around the Ayers Rock area. So the story is that women were dancing on the clay flats around Ayers Rock, which is in the middle of Australia. It's a super holy, sacred spot. And a man was watching them dance. And um, they saw him watching them, like kind of pervy, watching them and they began to run away and then this man was joined by another man which was his friend and uh, the women that were sort of fleeing away they liked the first man that even though they sort of ran away from him he was he wasn't so bad but the second guy who showed up they didn't like at all and they were very very afraid of him and the oldest sister said uh, don't everybody don't stay in the rocks or don't sit on the grass or or the bad man may come up from underground and get us so make sure you sit down on good ground that's been cleared um and uh, older sister protects the younger sisters, gives them good advice about where to sit so they don't get, um, you know, attacked by the by the bad man. Um, so they 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 travel and they they're followed by these by these two men, um, and um, it. Turns out, in the case of the myth, and by the way, these myths are not written down. So this is not a myth that somebody wrote down once. These are songs that are sung. And they've done recent performances. Aboriginal women have done recent performances of the entire song cycle of the Pleiades. That I mean, they go on for hours and hours and hours, and they're super interesting. But, um, but eventually what happens in the story is that there's the two guys that are chasing... Um, these, these seven sisters, it turns out that one of them is okay and the one of them's not. And the one that's not is, it's not ever explicitly said, but it's very clearly implied that the one that's not okay is the first guy's penis, <laughs> which is just really hilarious. Like the, the person, the man is okay. It's his dick that causes all the problems that women want to get away from. You know, it's like the, the, the guy is fine. His, his sex drive is the problematic thing. And I find that that's actually kind of interesting. Robin Williams once said that God gave men a brain and a penis, but only enough blood to use one at a time. <laughs> so... So the first man is like the man using his brain, and the second man is like the man using his penis. And they, they over the course of the story, they chase these women across all these land formations and, and things. And uh, when you analyze the story, when you look at it, um, every verse of the story, when she says, like, sit down on good, clear ground to keep away from the man who's chasing us, that is also important to do in those locations because of snakes because australia has the most deadliest snakes in the world and spiders too and so the advice to make sure that there's good ground and not to wander off into the grass you know it helps you pr escape from these guys who are chasing us but it also helps you stay safe from from snakes and and like another verse will be like you know and, and they the sisters got thirsty and they looked over behind this rock and there was a well and in the places where they told that story, there was a well behind the rock. So the story itself, the poem itself, the song itself, is connected to the actual land of Australia as you travel across it. Now, eventually what happens is the sisters enter into a cave, and the, the bad man, Wadi Nyiru, enters into the cave after them, and the sisters emerge up into the sky as the seven sisters, and Wadi Nyiru follows up and chases them. And that's the eventual story. So what this is, is called a song line. And a song line, I have an image here for you, but this is, this is the, the, the central um, uh, band here is called the Pleiades song line. And these are the areas where the story that I just told you is told. Now, of course, it's told in a lot more involved way, but it's told all across central Australia. And in each of these locations, different tribes live. There are hundreds and hundreds of different um, 
Australian Aboriginal languages and tribes. So it's told across languages and across tribes. And at every point along the way, the verses of the song that, that narrate the, the, the flight of the seven sisters will orient the traveler to the natural phenomenon, presence of water, possible dangers, um, you know, and things like that. So it provide kind of a safe travel as you move from one end of Australia to the other, um, which is astonishing. I mean, it really is amazing that this poem, this Pleiades songline, um, connects Australia. And by the way, so um, I didn't say this before, but people have been, Australian Aborigines lived in Australia for 40,000 years before white people showed up. Nobody showed up until 17, uh, like 65. Nobody lived in Australia except Aborigines until seven until two hundred years ago, and uh, there were hundreds of thousands of Aborigines on the land. And like I said, they had different languages and different traditions, but they shared this Pleiades songline, and it meant and directly implied that people could travel across the whole continent of Australia, following the songline of the Pleiades. This is incredible it's incredible and in so many different ways i mean it's very just mystifying in a lot of different ways but one of the ways that it's most mystifying to me is how in the world do you have a culture that's forty thousand years old that's been isolated from the rest of the world tell a story about the seven sisters being pursued into the sky by a hunter that's the same story as the ancient greeks told how how does that happen? They weren't talking to each other. The Greeks and the Aborigines weren't trading. There was no way for that to have been spread through diffusion. It couldn't be like, well, the Australians told it and then the trader traveled to the land and then told the story and they told the story because it didn't happen because Australians didn't have boats. They didn't leave the island. Nobody knew about them until 1765. How are the Australians talking about this cluster of stars being seven sisters? When it could be seven anything. In Thailand, you know, they have sort of seven hens. Actually, hens is another sort of common one. But how, how are, are Australia and Greece telling the same story? But it's way worse than that. Because people in Africa, Kenya people in Africa tell story of seven sisters chased by a giant ogre. Cheyenne Indians in North America tell of seven sisters. Mono Indians outside of Visalia tell the story of seven sisters. It's like told Northern and Southern Hemisphere all over the world that these stars, I mean, not every culture tells them it's seven sisters, but tons and tons of do, do. they call them seven sisters. How? in the world do you have different cultures looking at that constellation of stars and calling them seven sisters being chased by a by a man how how does the same story appear all over the world and through throughout time i don't understand that is it diffusion like well one person told the story and then they told the story yeah it, i guess but the first person who told that story had to live in africa 100,000 years ago to explain how it got to Australia and to Greece and to the Americas and to everywhere. It had to be way, way, super old. And nobody who told the story along the way could have changed it. How are you going to have a story that stays the same for a hundred years, let alone a thousand years, let alone a hundred thousand years? So I just am mystified um, by that. But it brings us to our um, uh, quiz question. So one of the things I decided to do is I'm going to make a quiz based on this video. Um, and the quiz is going to be super easy. <laughs> I'm telling you what the quiz questions are. And so get out a notepad or pen or whatever and, and, and write this down. Um, it's only going to be a couple questions, the quiz. But this is going to be one of the questions. And I, I'm going to use this quiz to kind of just solidify certain key points in the material in the presentation. And um, the first is, well, the, the, the concept is how scholars explain the similarities between myths. 
So two cultures tell a myth, it's similar. How did that similarity happen? And it's a complex question and I don't have all the answers and I don't even have many of the answers. And maybe I don't have any of the answers. <laughs> <clears throat> Maybe I'm just the person who looks at it and goes, whoa, that's weird. <laughs> what the hell is going on with that? Diffusion is easy enough to understand. I mean, when, when I tell you a story, like I told you the story of the, you know, of the seven sisters in Australia being chased by the man and his friend. And the man was okay, but his friend was not. And the man was the male, and his friend was the male's penis. I mean, that's just really funny to me. If you go tell that story to someone else, one of your friends or colleagues or coworkers, that's diffusion. I told the story to you, you tell it to them, they go tell it to someone else. And, you know, really good storytellers, you know, pick up these stories. And that's, they spread through space and time because someone tells it to their grandkid, and then they die, and their grandkid grows up, and he tells it to someone who goes somewhere else. And that's just how stories they diffuse and uh, changes are made here and there and some things stay the same so that's one but there's another idea of how stories are so similar that's entirely different and to dig into this we have to go into Jungian psychology there's a great Swiss I'll talk more about Carl Jung in a second but there was a great Swiss psychologist named Carl Jung who basically believe that human minds all over the world and throughout time have the ba same basic structure. And so we have a very strong tendency to create the exact same stories because our minds aren't that different from one another. And he called this the collective unconscious. And, um, you know, it, he wasn't right and he wasn't wrong. It's just a theory that is interesting in some ways. And here's one of the ways it's interesting. How did cultures all over the world look at the Pleiades and call them seven sisters? Well, maybe it has something to do deeply to do with human collective unconscious, our unconscious minds that we share with each other that include our instincts and fears and just the basic, the basic building blocks of human consciousness. Maybe it's something in the basic building blocks of human consciousness that we all share that tends to interpret um, seven beings moving followed by something else as being um, women being chased by a man. I don't know, but it's an interesting idea. And you may find plenty of opportunities throughout the course of the semester to look at a myth and to look at another myth and go, is it possible that these stories were told to get from one to the other? And say, well, yeah, okay, if it's possible that the stories were just told and retold, then that's diffusion. But if it seems like it's really not all that possible, well, maybe these stories are emerging from the collective unconscious. A lot of the episodes from the hero's journey seem to emerge from the collective unconscious. And there are other things as well. So these, these are two, and I'm not going to give you any more. So just I want you to think about these two. These are two ways of explaining why stories are similar across cultures. And that's pretty much it. So there will be a quiz question on it. And uh, so you should understand it. It's going to be super simple and straightforward. Uh, I'm not trying to trick anybody. I just want really uh, the quiz is just so make sure that uh, so I can tell who watched the video. <laughs> if somebody gets a zero on the quiz, I'm going to be like, yeah, you didn't watch the video. Um, and you can't AI it either, right? I mean, there's no way of like, well, I'll just, it'll just ask artificial intelligence. What did, what's the quiz question? It doesn't know. So anyways, so that's enough what we have for the, um, for the um, stars. And uh, we'll move on. We were, we're about 50 minutes or so in. Um, I had initially planned on these presentations being about the actual length of a lecture, which would be an hour and 20 minutes, but I probably don't have it in me to go for an hour and 20 minutes. So I'll probably tell you a little bit about the sun mythology. There is a ton of myths and stories about the sun, tons and tons and tons. So maybe I'll tell you one of two of my favorites and then we'll call it a day. Um, so I have some slides here, the Sopi, Hopi um, sun myth. There's the Hopi sun symbol. Um, I was going to tell, I still may tell a story of the Japanese goddess of the sun, Amaterasu. That's kind of a funny story. I probably should tell that one. 
um, New Grange in Ireland. Um, uh, it's a solstice uh, building. Yeah, it's very interesting too. Um, and then another uh, set of material for the quiz called the Myth Ritual School. So anyways, those are the other slides that, um, that I have about the sun. So I have the Hopis, I have Japanese, I have Kel a Celtic or Proto-Celtic um, New Grange, um, and then I want to talk about that, um, the connection between myth and ritual. I think of the, of the ones I really want to talk most about the Hopis, and um, for a couple reasons. Number one, um, there are cultures that when you study them, at least for me, I just really kind of become like, I just feel like they're very, very beautiful people. And Australian Aborigines are one. I, I read a, a Aboriginal mythology and culture and tradition, and I just could walk away thinking, these are some of the sweetest, most beautiful souls I have ever come across in my life. They just are. I promise you that this, this lady right here is one of the most beautiful people you will ever meet because it comes through in their stories they're just kind of they're humble and they're simple and they're full of humor and they're and they're kind and they're you know they're just got all these wonderful things another people that i'm just totally in love with are the hopi indians of the pueblo they're from the south american southwest um the four corners area of utah new mexico colorado and um, arizona and um they're just this beautiful beautiful people with wonderful stories and wonderful mythology um well, the psychologist I was telling you about before, Carl Jung, um, went to visit them in the 1930s, and he found an elder. Um, I have a painting here of the elder. His name's Otwe Bianu, and that name means um, mountain lake in the Hopi language. Um, and they just had an interesting, Jung was already a very well-established, one of the founders of modern psychology. Um, Jung was Freud's, like... Uh, well, we'll talk about more about these guys later. But but Jung was Freud's golden child. He was Freud founded psychoanalysis and was the founder of modern psychology and discovered the unconscious mind and all this stuff. And Jung was his sort of anointed successor. And then they argued and they disagreed about something and they they got really mad at each other and they unfriended each other. They unfollowed each other. <laughs> and so, but Jung was very well known and everything. And he went to study and and absorb the cultures non-western cultures um, in africa and the new world and he went to the taos pueblo i think it was the taos pueblo in, um, in hopi land and met this elder named otwe bianu and um, they had a conversation that lasted a, you know it was a couple days young was there but the conversation made such an impression on him that young wrote about it in his memoirs 30 years later he was just recalling this 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 meeting with this elder um the one of the things that really impressed Jung about this elder was they were sitting up on top of one of the pueblos, one of the houses, and um, Ochoa Biano was looking at the sun, and he said, "You know, isn't it isn't it wonderful? You know how how God moves across the sky and gives us warmth." And Jung is like, "That's that's God," and Biano was like. Of course. And Jung was like, it's the sun. It's not God. And Viana was like, everything that exists exists because of the sun. If you have if you took the sun away, nothing could live. There would be no plants, no animals, no no not every every living thing on earth owes its existence directly to the sun. If the sun disappears, it's just outer space. There is zero. The sun is God. And Jung was like, well, what about if there was God who made the sun? And he was just, he just looked at him like he was a, you know, ungifted child. Bianca looked at Jung and said, the sun is God. And that just made it, that made a, um, it made an impression on him. And there's, you know, there's tons. We have great sources of information about um, about the Hopi tradition. Um, and I wanted to uh, talk about um, one of their sun myths, which I, I find to be very beautiful. Um, 
it's uh, in the beginning, there was a creator God named Taiwa, and he lived in the vast, um, endless, empty space. And he created a being called Sotuknam, which was his uh, a male, and in order to order and structure, give order and structure to the cosmos. Um, and so Tuknong did that and then um, went to the earth realm and ordered and structured the earth, but um, didn't have a, uh, there was no life on earth. And so, so Tuknong made um, Spider Woman. This is a very common um, character in Hopi mythology. Uh, so Tuknong created Spider Lady or Spider Woman and gave her the, um, the job of creating life human life. And so she did uh, plants and birds and animals of all kinds, and she gave them their forms and their names, and she sang over them um, the song of creation. And when Sotuknong came back, he was very pleased with the work Spider Lady had done, and he went to his um, father, uh, Taiwa, and told them, and Taiwa came down and and uh, was very, very pleased with the work that Sotuknong and Spider Lady had done. Uh, but they hadn't made humans yet, and so uh, Taiwa said, now you're greatest uh, your greatest achievement is to make humans and so she did she made uh, she gathered earth of four different colors black and brown and red and yellow which represent the different skin tones of people and she mixed it, the clay with saliva from her mouth and she molded some of them in the image of Sotuknong and those were the males and she molded some of them in the image of herself and those were the females um, and then um, when the sun rose, uh, she told them, this is your father. Um, you are meeting him for the first time. And and this is this is one of these like areas where I just sort of the Hopi culture is so beautiful. It really I mean, it is. So so spider lady, when she made these first people out of the earth, different colors of the earth, the sun rose up and she said, this is your father who you're meeting for the first time. And his plan of life for you is the warmth of love. That's a really, really beautiful thing to tell the hu or human creation. This is the son, he is your father, and his plan of life for you is the warmth of love. And that's the song she sings over these human beings she's created, and she then sends them on their way. Um, and she sings over them uh, that... Um, the, the, the song of creation, yeah, and sends them on their way. I was wondering if I should tell you the song of creation, but it would take up too much time. So finally, she gave them um, the power of speech and, uh, and taught them um, how to reproduce and multiply. And she said, with all these, I have given you this world to live on and be happy. Um, there is only one thing I ask of you, to respect the creator at all times. Only one rule as humans have, to respect the Creator at all times. Wisdom, harmony, and respect for the love of the Creator who made you. Wisdom, harmony, and respect for the love of the Creator who made you. May it grow and never be forgotten among you as long as you live. And then the people went in their direction. So that's just a beautiful story. I think that's a beautiful story. It's, it's, it's replicated in the Hopi birth ritual, which was studied by a guy named, I think, Frank Waters. And he told the story of, he went to the Taos Pueblo, I think, I forget when, 40s and 50s or something like that. But he recorded the, the birth ritual of the Hopi people. And it's really beautiful, too, and it totally connects with this, this sun mythology. Um. What they would do is the women, a woman would get pregnant and she would give birth and they would set up the house, a little hut, a little Pueblo, like a, not a big house, but like a one room type thing. And they would close off all the windows and doors and it would be very, very dark. And the woman would give birth in that and she would be there with the baby for one month in the dark. And other women would come. They would, it was a very sacred time. It was a, um, uh, they would bring them water and food, and the and then the baby and the mother nap together, and it, they just feel like were with each other's presence, without light or sight. They weren't. They weren't. They weren't focusing on objects. It was only presence with each other, the baby, the mother, and the physical touch. 
and other women would come and bring them food and water and and the mother and the baby just bonded in this deep profound way for one month and then uh, after one month um the women the, the the mothers sisters and the grandmother and everybody would come and they had special rituals they bathed the, the baby and I think cornmeal and and ash and ashes and cedar water and they bathed the baby and all everybody gave them the baby that its name it was a sort of a naming ceremony and then um, and then all the women left except the mother and her mother and the mother the grandmother and the mother uh, waited all through the night with the baby and when the sun when it came time to be the sun. Uh, rise. They took the baby and they walked east out of the village. And they walked up to a special spot away from all people, all the village, all everybody away, and they watched the sunrise together. And it was the this was the like this was the first time the baby had seen light. <laughs> and so the sun comes up, and the, the the mother and the grandmother hold the baby up to the sun, and they say, "Behold your father." And then the the world becomes, you know, daylight comes and the baby sees light for the first time, sees creation for the first time with his mother and his grandmother. And then they take the baby back and introduce him to the village. And, and you know, the rest of the life sort of carries forward from that. Um, it, it is just an incredibly beautiful, beautiful, beautiful story. A ritual. It's not even a story. That actually happens. That's how Hopi people introduce their kids to the world. The kid and the mother just cuddle with each other for a month straight, taken care of by their community. And then the mother and the grandmother take them out and show them the sunrise and say, here's your father. Here's God. And his plan for you is the light of warmth and love. So I'm just totally charmed by the Hopi people. I have good book recommendations for um, one amazingly interest, great book on them. But they're just a lovely, lovely people. So, um, you know, Ochwe Bianu was a little bit, he was like talking about how we don't understand, we Hopi, we don't understand the white people. He said the white people are, they're never satisfied. They're always talking. They're always anxious. They're always stressing out. They always want to talk and stress. We don't understand them. What do they want? They have everything. What do they want? They always want something, want something, want something. Why? Why do they want something? We don't understand them. We think they're, we think they're crazy. And Carl Jung asked him, why do you think they're crazy? And Ochoa Bianu said, because they say they think with their heads. And that was really surprising to him. He was not expecting that answer. He said, well, yeah, we do. We think with our heads. Why, what do you think with? And Ochoa Bianu says, we think here. I think with this. That's an interesting answer. Thinks with his heart. Yeah. So uh, that's the Hopi sun myth. Um, there's the Hopi sun symbol. Um, I'll very briefly tell you this story of Amaterasu's Sue's cave. I'll skip over the. Um, I'll skip over this one. Maybe we'll come back to this one, New Grange, at a later um, lecture. This is this is very um, simple. Um, well, it's not, but I'll make it simple. So Amaterasu is the Japanese goddess of the sun. Her brother Susanoo is the god of the wind. And um, their mother died, um, Izanami. And they were really, you know, Susanoo especially was really upset when Izanami died. Izanagi, or yeah, Izanagi, their dad was still around, but their mother died. She went to the underworld. It's a whole other story. Um, and uh, Susanoo and Amaterasu were brother and sister. And um, there's there was an event that happened that made Susano really upset. And he's the god of the wind and storms. And so he blusters and rages and and um, and he got mad at his sister and he was doing all these things to provoke her. There's a couple of little funny little episodes like one of the things he did 
um, was he got a horse and he skinned it, he flayed it, and he cut up the bloody body parts and he threw it into her house. And one of her serving maids was so terrified by this cut up bloody, you know, flayed horse that she, she turned around and jumped around and banged her vagina on a, on a, we on a weaving loom and died. <laughs> That's one of the things about mythology that's so great is there are some major left turns. I did not have that on my bingo card. <laughs> she banged her vagina against a shuttle, a weaving shuttle <laughs> and died. And Amaterasu was like, well, she held it together. But then Susano was like, oh, I'm going to, yeah. And so he, he went to her chair where she had her dinner and he took a big shit on her chair and uh, and then left. And when she sat down to for dinner, she sat in the middle of his feces and was like, and then she lost it. He was doing all this other stuff before and she was holding it together. But that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And she just flew off in a rage and she went and found this cave and hid in her cave um, and wouldn't come out. And so she's a god of goddess of the sun. And so there was no light. And so things couldn't grow and everything was dark and everything was you know, all that. Um, and so the people were, the gods and the spirits and the kami beings were trying to coax her out of the cave and she wouldn't come. Um, and they were doing things like they put them, um, they were playing mu musical instruments and banging on drums and this, doing these dances and stuff like that. Um, bo body dances like twerking. I mean, one of the goddesses was twerking and trying to get everybody to laugh. And they were just trying to get her out of the cave, um, get her curiosity or whatever. And uh, finally, uh, somebody got a mirror and they held it up. They hung it in a tree or something like that. And then the, 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 the goddess who was twerking, she's like the goddess of laughter or whatever. The, she was twerking. She took off her um, breast and started like shaking her breasts around. And everybody's just laughing, laughing, laughing. And, um, and Amaterasu is like, what are they laughing about? I'm, I'm the sun. I'm in the cave. They should be crying and grieving. They shouldn't be having so much fun. And so she kind of peeks her her head out and she sees this uh, her reflection in the mirror, but she doesn't know it's a reflection in the mirror. She thinks it's just this gorgeous, beautiful goddess. And she becomes more and more interested in it. And she comes out further and further. And then somebody who was one of the gods was standing next to her. He grabs her and he, he pulls her out. She goes back up into the sky and then light returns to the world. And uh, that ritual, and there's a set of, set of rituals that's that's performed in connection with this story throughout Japan. And it's performed during winter solstice. And so winter solstice is an extremely important time, not only in Japan, but everywhere um, in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, it's the time when the days become shortest and People understand the principles of solstice. They understand that days get very short and then they start getting longer again. And once they get longer, that means we can start planting and growing and food comes and sex and life and abundance. And then the, the, the second half of the year is a time of constriction and, and uh, husbanding your resources and things like that. So um, the, um, the, the, the last thing I want to talk about here is this connection between myth and ritual. Um, and it's really super important, actually. Um, there's actually a, 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 a group of scholars, they're called the Myth Ritual School. I always call them schools, I don't know why, but like a group of scholars throughout the 20th century that emphasized and wrote books of scholarship about how myth and ritual were so closely connected. And some of them said that every myth always had a ritual and every ritual always had a myth. And I don't know if most people would go quite that far, but there, it's enough of a connection for us to make it a point for our class that very, very often in very important ways, stories are told that connect with an actual real world ritual. They connect to the real world, their natural phenomenon or in some kind of ritual. Why that's important for our class means that sometimes we don't necessarily know what the myth is. We can look at a ritual and we can say there's probably some story here, even though nobody ever wrote the story down and we don't have access to it. But sometimes we have access to rituals that were almost certainly there was a mythology connected to it. And sometimes we'll have myths that we'll wonder, I wonder if there was a ritual for this. And there probably was for a lot of them. 
So it's something that I would like you to be present in your mind as you're experiencing the myths um, that we talk about for the rest of the semester. This very um, common uh, and frequent connection between stories and, and, and rituals. I wouldn't go so far as these Cambridge, you know, this school to say they're always connected. I don't think so. I think sometimes stories are just stories. Sometimes rituals may have, I don't know. I really don't, I don't know if every ritual always has a story. I'm not sure that it's, it looks like black and white, that it's every, all myths have rituals and all rituals have myths. I don't think so. But it's probably true that most of them do. It's probably true that most myths have rituals and most rituals have myths, or at least a lot, enough to be, to emphasize. So sometimes as we go forward in this class, we'll be talking about, we'll be talking about a ritual and we won't necessarily know the myth. And sometimes we'll be talking about a myth and we'll say like, oh, I wonder if there's a ritual associated with that. Maybe, maybe. It's a connection that I would like you to be present in your mind and for you to think about. Okay, that's a, a lot of content. Um, so we'll have two quiz questions. One of them will be on this myth ritual school. And I'm not going to ask like some kind of detailed question about this. Don't study it too hard. It's going to be very, very simple. If you've been listening to me talking, it's you're going to get the answer. And we're going to have one about diffusion versus the collective unconsciousness, how myths spread. So there's a couple questions. And then I'll probably ask you a third one, like which culture did I not talk about? And it'll be like Australian Aborigines, Hopi Indians, Japanese Sun Cave, and um, like, you know, Aztec. We didn't talk about the Aztecs. So it'll be something like multiple choice where we'd be like, if you watch this video, it's obvious. The purpose of the quiz will just be to see who watched the video and who didn't. So if you watch the video, you're gonna get 100%. Okay, well, that's been a, a real ride for me to talk to myself for an hour and 20 minutes. I hope it came across okay. Because <laughs> if it sucked from your point of view, you're in for a long semester because we got more of these to go. Uh, anyways, uh, send me a message or anything if you need anything. I hope you guys are all doing well, and uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. Bye.